morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this last day of May 2023. That's right, 31st of May 2023 and what do we have for you? Well, first of all, uh, the smoke that's all about. It's uh, from the, well, it's supposed to be the controlled uh, bus banning uh, out the western uh, side and the western suburbs. Uh, and that's what's caused the, the uh, smoke to come into the city and all around the north side uh, and south side as well. So everywhere. So it is, uh, you know, it's supposed to be very high, high danger there as well. So, you know, today the temperatures will be the, from 9 degrees in the morning it was and to uh, 24 degrees later in the day. Well, there you are. So that's uh, that's that's where we are on that. So right now, let's get on with the news. And with the news, uh, what's going to happen is uh, first of all, we we'll look at what's going to happen with that uh, new announcement in uh, Western Australia. So who's taking up that top role? Who's taking on the, on on the top role there? So let's go have a look at let, let, let's have a look at that uh, report. The day began with plenty of talking to be done. Obviously I'm confident that I'm the one that, that should lead the state, but I, I accept that we have a process to go through and I'll be doing that in a very respectful way. Well, I'm just talking to people now. I haven't made any decision, just talking to people. Oh look, I'm just trying to walk the dog. I'll have a coffee and I'm talking to my colleagues this morning. Left faction MPs aligned with the United Workers Union met first. Among them, Amber Jade Sanderson and Roger Cook. But it was the current health minister who emerged victorious. I've been chosen uh, with a clear majority uh, to be the candidate to go forward uh, for the leadership. Uh, I will now reach out to my colleagues. Roger Cook left without comment. Down, but not out of the race. His prospects lifted when the AMWU, the other key left faction union, met and backed him in. We've made a decision uh, about what we think is best for Western Australia. So our support is for Roger Cook as Premier. Uh, if Rita Safiotti was to put her hand up for Deputy Premier, we would also support her in that position too. Mr Cook and Ms Safiotti met this afternoon, agreeing that partnership could work. With the joint Roger and Rita ticket also winning the support of Labor's right faction, the writing was on the wall. Late today, Amber Jade Sanderson withdrew from the race, saying in the interests of unity and stability, she will not be putting herself forward, adding she looks forward to working with the new leadership team. A former political staffer to Stephen Smith and Jim McGinty, Roger Cook was a member of the Miscellaneous Workers' Union, now the United Workers' Union. He went on to work with Indigenous organisations and in communications and PR. Roger Cook was elected to Parliament in 2008 as the member for Quinana. There was no political apprenticeship, he was immediately thrust into the role of deputy. His face has become more familiar to most, having helped guide WA through the pandemic as Health Minister, before becoming Minister for State Development and Tourism in 2021. Are you looking forward to being Premier? Well, look, I, I think I'm ready to lead. Uh, I've been the Deputy Premier for six years now, working with Mark in some tough times, particularly during COVID. His next assignment? Putting his own stamp on the government, after Mark McGowan's dominant six-year reign. State political reporter James Carmody is at Parliament. James, were we expecting a resolution to the leadership so quickly? When Roger Cook's own union voted for Amber Jade Sanderson this morning, things were looking a little up in the air. But when it then emerged that the rest of Labor was firmly behind Roger Cook and Rita Safiotti, they soon became confident they had the numbers. And so there risked being a long, drawn-out leadership ballot process unless Amber Jade Sanderson pulled out. And she withdrew late today, which allows for a smooth transition for the government and a clean start for Roger Cook as Premier as he steps out from the shadow cast by the political giant that was Mark McGowan. Mr Cook will now decide who is in charge of what in his cabinet ahead of a ministerial reshuffle and then will come the official swearing-in ceremony for the 31st Premier of Western Australia. Thanks James. James Carmody there.
The challenges which loomed large under Mark McGowan will likely be amplified under Roger Cook. Despite working hand in glove with the Premier for the past 11 years, he doesn't enjoy the same level of authority in the party, nor the high level of public support. And there'll be no time for him to settle in with the government's pile of problems starting to mount. The new Labor leader and Premier will not only inherit a strong economy, but all the ongoing challenges the government faces. The previous Premier enjoyed incredible popularity, with, which insulated him around a lack of progress on a couple of key issues. The new Premier doesn't have that luxury, so they've really got to get things done in order to demonstrate why they're up to the job. Roger Cook will need to hit the ground running on burning issues such as the health system, juvenile justice, the skills shortage, as well as housing shortages and homelessness. You've got a big caucus and you've got a lot of different interests. Now all of those were compliant because Mark McGowan was so dominant. He can exp expect some of those other voices to become more loud and to demand various issues to be addressed. And with a softening of iron ore prices, there's a warning of looming economic challenges. Diversification can't wait. Um, we really need to make sure that it's front and centre um, and is a first priority for any new Premier. It won't be simple to guarantee results in areas where the government spent big in the last budget, such as social housing, health and infrastructure. It's going to be a real challenge for the government to deliver on their promises. That's particularly due to the labour and skill shortages that we have at the moment. The 2021 election was without doubt the political high watermark for Labor, securing huge majorities in both houses of parliament. The party was always going to lose some seats at the 2025 poll, but the new Premier will have a much harder job keeping that number to a minimum. It will be a matter of political life or death for Labor MPs in traditionally conservative seats, such as Katrina Stratton here in Nedlands. It's going to be very hard for the government to sustain its current levels of popularity. Straight away, the new Premier will have a fight on his hands, with other states already piling on the pressure over WA's GST deal. Nick Perpich, ABC. So there you go, you had it first on Australian Indian Radio. So uh, congratulations to Roger Cook on taking on the top role. Uh, but as uh, it was mentioned that it will be a bit of a challenge for him, especially filling in those uh, big shoes of uh, Mark McGowan, who was very popular and he had set some very high standards uh, and he had some very uh, you know, uh, amazing results up there on the board. So that will be something to match. Well, moving on, one of the news that we talked about later in the week was uh, the student debts. Uh, and there was some consolation as to, you know, when and how they will pay that. But is it, uh, you know, any closer to being resolved or are there still concerns on that front? I'm staring down the barrel of about $54,000 of hex debt. Um, that was the case as of two weeks ago. Uh, however, last week I kind of panicked and put $10,000 of my house deposit savings into my hex debt uh, before indexation increases tomorrow. So for people who aren't super familiar with it, the HEX loans are interest free, but they do rise on indexation. So while they might have had increases over the years of 2% here and there, what we're seeing across all of the community with the inflation is hitting the HEX repayments as well. And that comes in from tomorrow. Yeah, I think a lot of us in the community are a bit confused. Um, a lot of us enter university with very basic financial literacy. Um, speaking for myself, I had very little knowledge. And so I entered university at 17, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Um, and I think a lot of us now in the workforce are thinking, wait, hang on, we're going to be paying this off until retirement. This feels insane. Mm. The, the, the repayments don't kick in until you start earning a particular amount of money, right? Correct, yes. Okay, what are you hearing from some of your other colleagues though about the strain that that's putting on them and what it means? Yeah, I think um, a big topic of conversation is around uh, intergenerational inequality. Um, I dropped my first Masters of Education because I couldn't afford unpaid PRAC. Uh, and the ceiling cap on repayments for HEX um, is arguably too low. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, ideally we'd be freezing indexation as the National Uni Union of Students are arguing for. Um, but I think at the very least the government could consider uh, increasing that cap so that um, young people, especially 
actually don't need to start paying back that hex until they're on a higher wage. Okay, when you mean by the cap, talk to me about that. Um, so when you earn a certain, certain amount, then you start paying back your hex debt. And so that is incremental, so it might be $50 a week, um, or if you are earning higher, it'll be a higher amount. For example, it's going to take me a minimum of eight years to pay my hex debt off, and that's paying $500 a month, and that's uh, the equivalent of earning $95,000 salary. So intergenerational inequality. Well, I mean, in the olden days, uh, uh, if you could only go to university if your parents could afford to send you there. That was the, the you know, day when uh, not many people could get uh, university degrees uh, and elevate. So the system of Hex was that, okay, you come in uh, and uh, get a loan to get, get to university, get your education, and then interest-free, uh, loan will be given there. Well, it was subject to rise on indexation, but uh, there was no interest on it. And the repayments are not horrendous uh, from my uh, perspective. Um, you know, if you're earning a good money after you have uh, acquired a good degree on an interest free loan, and where your parents didn't have to go and mortgage their houses or properties uh, or sell off assets uh, to just send you to university or anyone to university. So if you look at that system uh, and the the ceilings and the increments, uh, that is something that probably can be looked at. But overall, uh, you know, in scheme of things, when she's talking about intergenerational inequality if you look at uh, in the in the very early days is you didn't have hacks who could go to university it was only the people who could afford to pay the university fees or if your parents could afford to pay for that then only you went into universities uh, because universities were never cheap and they were never free except for some countries they, it, the conditions could be different such as Switzerland but uh, you need to be a citizen and uh, many many other conditions to apply there as well so it's a balancing act uh, everyone has always got a point of view and people normally look at things from their point of view you need to look at the other side of the equation as well now to my next topic which is skilled worker shortage what can be done as we know, Australia is a vast land. We are only living on the edges. There's so much potential on here. We've got, uh, you know, endless plains, as as is said in our national anthem. But of course, there are challenging conditions. They are dry. So, what can we do? How can we best utilize those resources? With ample sunshine and unobstructed winds, renewable energy projects are tapping into the power of the outback. It's also windy when everywhere else in the country isn't windy. In Queensland's northwest, the so-called super hub is set to generate 10 gigawatts of renewable energy. Once built, a 500,000 voltage transmission line will connect Mount Isa to the national electricity grid on the east coast near Townsville. It's going to be the largest network project in Australia. But the Clean Energy Council warns across the country there's not enough skilled labour to build and maintain these sorts of large-scale energy projects. We need to at least double the clean energy workforce by 2030 and we'll need to double it again by 2035 at least to reach around 250,000 workers. With all of the work in the construction industry in the next couple of years in Australia there will be some need for some overseas workers. Many though are optimistic about the impact on rural towns. Around 400 kilometres inland from Townsville lies the rural town of Prairie. With fewer than 100 residents, it's hoped the large-scale project will re-energise population growth. But locals admit the town and nearby Hewenden in their current state wouldn't cope. Whether you're looking at the hospital, whether you're looking at the schools, um, whether you're looking at the roads um, or the housing, it, it does need to be upgraded to accommodate for that larger population coming in. Desperately we will need more water because um, that bore that's servicing prairie at the moment is about 80 years old and so we're just it's it's just coping with the population that's there now present day infrastructure that needs to catch up with a green energy future it's a land of opportunity it just needs a bit of help to get there mia knight abc news prairie so there you go uh, the skill shortage that we're talking about 
Now, uh, there's two things here, energy, which we will look at, uh, we will discuss that as well. The first part was uh, the skill shortage. Now, we know that there's a lot of uh, students who have come to Australia, they have completed their studies uh, and many have got good stable jobs as well, but they're still waiting to get their visas granted. Uh, they're, you know, the permanent migrancy, the pathways to that. So, you know, why don't we utilize the people we have already got here? Uh, you know, there are many people who are on the waiting list as well. Uh, so, you know, to move the process uh, and uh, move forward. Now, when we look at energy, energy needs to be derived. And when you look at those rural towns where these towers are being put in, and if they have a large influx of uh, people, migrants coming into the town, uh, as was mentioned, that the infrastructure is not in place to cope up with that kind of influx of uh, new migrants uh, into that uh, the territory, into those regions, into those little towns. Um, and it will change the, the culture and everything. I'm not saying that it will deteriorate. Uh, it might add to that uh, with all different, uh, you know. And when we look at some of the rural communities where people have been happily living in the way they are, you know, uh, with the influx of new people coming in, uh, infrastructure and everything, sometimes the whole identity or what the town was known for, what it was famous for, being a rural town, not being you know a, in a large type city type environment that goes forever uh, with with uh, more people moving into the area so you will lose some of your old identity but of course infrastructure is needed more people is needed energy is needed these are some of the hard hitting facts which we need to come to terms with uh, and uh, maybe even some of our protesters who go out protest about these things must keep all these in mind as well so the two points number one skilled migration yes we need more people uh, number two there are many people here already on the waiting list why don't we uh, you know speed up the process uh, to grant them the visas uh, and uh, number three energy is something that's needed uh, you know we're always looking at new types but everything always comes with a little bit of consequences so you know it's nothing is uh, uh, you know we stay there forever we coal came in electricity is there then we started talking about uh, uh, the pollution uh, and everything then we started looking at renewable we're looking at solar wind and all these different uh, hydrogen has come into the equation as well but uh, you know whenever we're changing anything in this environment there will be consequences might not be known might not be visible and might not be apparent right at this point in time but it will show up in the future now for my next report we'll go to the housing industry we know there's a lot more people coming into the country a lot more are needed they all need houses to live and there is a shortfall of uh, houses now australia has had a very good building standards if you came from uh, different countries uh, and if you came to australia even if you had a build building license carpenter's license and all that you had to undergo uh, a, a test right here and uh, at the tafe and become familiar with the australian standards so that you are building to this high standards set by australian government now lately there has been because so there's a shortage there's so many houses being built a lot of them being built in a hurry builders are taking shortcuts and corners uh, and some of the new workforce that have come into the uh, into the market might not be up to date uh, with all the terms and conditions and the australian standards here's that report <laughs> supposed to be our dream home. It was supposed to be a dream of ours and it's not. Now it's the journey has turned into a nightmare. Ridiculous. Um, Danny Lyons is running out of patience and running out of money. People don't show up. They just don't turn up to do the work. It's been three years since she signed up with builder Burbank Homes and she's still waiting to move into her house. It's almost done but work has frustratingly slowed to a crawl. We can't do this anymore. We can't go past April. We can't, you know, 
We can't do another week in May. We can't just sit here and wait like you're telling us to. And their response is, there's nothing I can do. During the pandemic, the building industry experienced an unprecedented boom and government grants for new builds saw people sign up for new houses in their droves. But the cost of building due to supply shortages went through the roof. So these building companies locked into fixed contracts with home buyers watched their profit margins shrink as their costs went up. So it's sticks and bricks, you know, concrete, all the key inputs into housing construction have gone up on average 30% over a two year period. And the construction sector just has not been able to pass that cost increases onto its customers. And that's why companies are going into liquidation. They simply can't remain solvent with this huge cost increase. The pressures caused an industry-wide slowdown that many businesses couldn't survive. Current ASIC figures show more than 700 construction companies have fallen over since the start of 2023, and insolvencies in the sector are up by almost a third. The fear of a complete industry-wide collapse came into full view after the high-profile failure of Porter Davis, a high-end builder that was declared insolvent in March. Victoria's construction crisis is deepening with another major home builder going into administration. Marcorp, which owns Urban Edge and Eight Homes, went into administration soon after. Leaving 730 customers and more than 100 staff in limbo. Today, another company bit the dust, Slatter Group, which builds its homes in Perth suburbs. With the building industry on shaky foundations, those chasing the Australian dream are wondering whether the company they're building with will be the next to go under. Most of the times I don't see any activity around the house, so yeah, I don't know if people are coming in and making fixes. Amir Parker and his wife Shweta are with home builder Simmons. The build in the western suburbs of Melbourne began in early 2022, and although it looks almost done, Amir says a number of defects are yet to be fixed. Simmons has said it's fine for the family to move in. It's not uncommon for people to live in recently built homes with defects. I can see something red. But Amir and Shweta are reluctant to take the keys until the place is fully finished. They're at a stalemate. I feel like I'm very powerless. I don't have any power. I don't know what to do next, how to get this matter resolved. Every night I go to bed, I think about it. I talked to him about it. I, like, what do we do? Should we just move in? Amir's builder Simmons is feeling the pinch of cost pressures associated with the industry. Last month, it slashed about 70 jobs, and last year, it sought a $26 million cash injection by its shareholders. But today, it says it's through the worst. Amidst the uncertainty, one builder is using its financial stability as its main selling point. Tony, how are you going? Very well. Thanks. Anthony Blackshaw runs one of Australia's biggest builders, Henley. And if you've driven along a major highway in Melbourne recently, you'd be hard pressed to miss that it's well aware of consumer concerns about the home building market. Are these ads uh, a little bit cheeky? I think it's important to keep the public informed. But despite the promise of security, it's been hard to turn a profit. And with interest rates increasing, getting new customers has been challenging. Businesses have ended up with less revenue and higher costs, and that's not a great outcome uh, for any business. Um, unfortunately for some businesses, that has meant that they've made losses. One of the biggest issues affecting his company is getting workers. Throughout the pandemic, Henley capped the amount of houses it built, but it was still overwhelmed. They just couldn't find enough tradies to build all of the homes. What we did see during the initial years of the pandemic was a lot of labour um, go back overseas to their home countries. Um, and we also saw a lot of labour leave the domestic building industry and take up jobs on the big infrastructure projects. For home builders who have spent the last two years losing money on projects hand over fist, some believe conditions could soon improve. Today, most builders... And we really, really hope that the conditions do uh, improve. We know there's lots of uh, new migrants who have come into the country as well, and their trust and their aspiration is to have a home of their home. 
uh, of their own and they try and build their dream home. One, two things that have happened lately, the lots have, uh, the plots have become smaller and smaller. Uh, you know, when we first arrived here about 38 years ago, 405 square meter blocks were unheard of uh, 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 until it was right in the city as a duplex or something like that. Uh, but now that's become common uh, and the new developments in you know, our houses are right on top of each other. So the quality of life, uh, you know, uh, even though they're beautiful homes uh, and interior and everything would be very nice, but you're living right next uh, if you look out the window, you'll see in the other person's uh, house. Uh, those are the conditions. But the key fact remains that people are having problems uh, uh, with builders. Number one, defects. Number two, uh, uh, going over time. Uh, th there's the first report that a uh, couple they uh, spent more than three years still can't move into their house. So, uh, you know, tradies are hard to come by. They just don't turn up at work. So, you know, where are we headed? What is all this happening? Well, so ladies and gentlemen, that's, uh, that's the news and commentary for today uh, from Australian Indian Radio. Right now, let's take a look at some of the functions and events taking place. So there you are ladies and gentlemen, uh, up to date on Australian Indian Radio. Hey, it's been wonderful having your company this morning. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were some key topics that we covered uh, in today's segment. Uh, and if you have, uh, or if you'd like to get on uh, the show and discuss some of those issues yourself, you are quite welcome to do that. We can get you via our video link or you are quite welcome to come into the studio here as well. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, that's about all for today. It's been wonderful having your company as usual. Until tomorrow, it's goodbye from us. And uh, remember, this has been an Australian Indian radio production.